Hello there, and welcome to February's edition of Mondays with Matthew. Well, there were a lot of housing-related data releases in the month that are worthy of discussion, so let's get straight to it. And I'm actually going to start out with the latest home ownership numbers that were just released by the Census Bureau. Now, those of you who regularly watch my videos may remember uh, last year, and I suggested back then that the data may have been just a little bit suspect, specifically when it came to the second and third quarter ownership rates. Anyway, now for those that didn't see me address this, or if you've just forgotten, I had a concern about the significant spike in the rate that you can clearly see here. And I suggested that it might be suspect because of the way the data was gathered during the early days of COVID-19. You see, the survey was done via telephone and not in person, as it usually is, because of COVID-19 restrictions. And I believe that this actually led to an over-reporting of the real ownership rate. Anyway, following the massive spike we saw back in the second quarter, it appears that they have found a way to more accurately gather the data, and the rate has now pulled back to a level that, at least for me, passes my sniff test. However, uh, even though the share of U.S. households who own their homes did drop, uh, it still remains above the long-term average and currently stands at a level we haven't seen since 2012. And when we drill down into the data and look at the ownership rate for millennials, I know I do harp on about them a lot, but you can clearly see that they really are becoming homeowners in increasingly large numbers, uh, and the current rate of 38.5% is a share not seen since back in 2011. And I do believe this number will continue to rise over the course of the next several years. You see, demographics are driving them into home ownership as they're all getting older. Many are also starting families and they want to own a home. Now, I would also add that I wouldn't be at all surprised to see them shift toward ownership at even faster rates. And that is if they're allowed to work from home. And for those that are, that might lead them to move away from very expensive cities and move towards markets where it is more affordable and certainly markets where they can afford to buy. We will see. And to give you a slightly different perspective on these younger buyers, last week the New York Federal Reserve released their report on household debt. And it includes some amazing numbers regarding the share of mortgage borrowing by age. Well, uh, you can clearly see that younger buyers continue to account for a major share of total mortgage borrowing and are borrowing pretty substantial amounts as well. In fact, in 2020, millennials and Gen Z, yes, I did say Gen Z, uh, those households borrowed over $1.3 trillion to buy homes. Now that's over 35% of total new mortgage debt on a dollar basis. But although I think it's great to see younger households grow as homeowners and the overall home ownership rate continuing to rise, well, it's not all as I would like to see it, especially when we break down the ownership rate by ethnicity. And this report, again from the census, uh, showed that although the share of white households who own their homes ticked up, no big surprises there, but it clearly demonstrated some very significant disparities, with the ownership rate for black households, although up a little, still well below the levels seen with other ethnicities. This is a long-term and, in my opinion, systemic issue, and it needs to be addressed. Uh, the bottom line is that the ownership rate for black families in 2020 was 25% lower than for white families. Now, the disparity is even greater when you just look at the fourth quarter. Uh, the spread in the fourth quarter, 30%. Now, I would say that I certainly am very pleased that the Biden administration does have plans uh, to try and address this inequality by looking to expand the ability of the Federal Housing Authority to provide mortgages to lower income households. And this might, if, and a big if, it gets approved, start to address this very significant issue. Of course, nothing's going to get fixed immediately, 
but it is a major concern and I sincerely hope that over time this discrepancy will be addressed. Moving on, we had a very significant data drop again from the census uh, who provided their population estimates by area for 2019. Now I get that this data is old, but it's interesting all the same. Anyway, this first table shows the markets with the greatest increase in population between 2010 and 2019. Now, I'll be honest with you that I was not at all surprised to see Texas lead the way again, uh, but it was interesting to see the greater Seattle region, Denver, and also Riverside, California, all make it close to the top of the list. And because a couple of markets that were close to the top of this list are of interest to Windermere as we have offices in these areas, I thought it'd be interesting to look at how some of the other markets where we have a presence, or well, how they are doing, and the numbers equally as impressive. Of course, markets are of different sizes. So in order to balance this out, uh, the data here shows growth in percentage terms. And again, numbers very impressive. Look at Bend and Boise. And when I focused on just two year growth, well, again, very significant increases in Colorado, several Idaho markets, Las Vegas, Western Washington and Utah. Now, I would also add uh, that Greeley, you can see number one here, well, Greeley, Colorado ranked fourth nationally in terms of two year growth on a percentage basis. Bend came in seventh nationally, Boise ninth. Coeur d'Alene, 10th. Yes, I know this data is old. That's an issue I'm afraid I fight with every day, but I still see it as being very meaningful. Of course, I'm gonna be really, really interested uh, to see the 2020 numbers, as that will give us a, I think a clearer picture as to how COVID-19 really is impacting where we choose to live, but we're gonna to have to wait for that. But that said, I actually read a report recently uh, that was fascinating. It was published by the North American Moving Services, um, and they looked at where households who moved between states, well, where do they move to and where do they move from in 2020? Now, of course, uh, it's not a perfect analysis, far from it, but it does give us an idea as to not just looking at where people move to, but for me, it's interesting to find out where they moved from last year. Now, unsurprisingly, the largest out migration states, California, and uh, people moving out of California, they were mainly moving to Texas and to Idaho. But there was also very significant out migration from Illinois, New York, and New Jersey. As far as where most people migrated to, well, in addition to Idaho, people were also attracted to Arizona, Tennessee, and North and South Carolina. Now, interestingly, as you'll see here, uh, the northeastern states, well, they made up four out of the seven states with the most outbound moves, uh, and none of them made the top eight for inbound moves. Uh, number one, New York saw very significant out migration, and I believe part of that <coughs> is going to be down to the fact of uh, some changes in income tax policies in New York State. Number two, New Jersey. And Maryland, well, Maryland was just beaten into fourth place by California, came in number three. But as far as the Western US is concerned, other than California, people are consistently moving in and not out. Actually, and also supported by the census numbers we just discussed, the number of households relocating to Idaho, well, it's been increasing significantly for the past five years. I'd also add that Colorado, well, it's also been in the top 10, or at least very close to it, also for the past five years. Last week, we saw the latest data on building permits and housing starts. And although there was a softening in the number of starts in January, permit activity continues to grow significantly, with single family permits up by a massive 3.8% month over month, and kept coming in 30% higher than we saw a year ago. This is very good news. Now, uh, as far as the weakness uh, in starts is concerned, 
This is primarily due to some builders uh, who are, are still very worried about increasing lumber and other construction material costs, now, as well as concerns over delays in obtaining building materials because of COVID-19 supply chain issues. Now, I would add uh, that although single family starts did drop, the number of homes under construction, well, they continued to trend higher. And for those of you who might be wondering how new starts can drop, but the number of new homes being built can increase, well, it's pure terminology. You see, a housing start is where a foundation has been poured, but it doesn't mean that vertical construction has yet started. And in fact, the number of homes currently under construction in January, it was up by 1.1% month over month, and is now 16% higher than we saw a year ago. And last week, we also got the February take on builder confidence, and it was interesting to see it ticking back up as strong buyer demand, well, it clearly helped to offset the supply chain challenges and surging lumber prices that I just mentioned. Now on the right, now you'll see the three components of the index, and they showed the gauge of current sales conditions steady at a very impressive 90, while the component measuring sales expectations over the next six months, that fell a little bit, down three points to 80. But the gauge charting traffic of prospective buyers, well, that rose by four points to 72. Now, although all are off the peak we saw uh, late last fall, they are all still significantly above 50. And that means that more builders find the market favorable than not. So this was a pretty mixed bag, uh, but the market index numbers are more current than the permit and starts report. So I'm going to be very interested to see what the February housing starts numbers look like. It wouldn't surprise me to see a slight uptick there, given what we've just seen in regards to the February, February uh, index numbers. Finally, uh, the January US housing sales numbers were released by the National Association of Realtors. And well, they were yet again record breaking. On the supply side, uh, any hopes that we might have seen the number of listings rise in January? Sorry, they were dashed with total inventory coming in at a measly 1.04 million homes for sale. That's down 25.7% year over year and a new record low in absolute terms, but also a record percentage drop between January of 2020 and last month. Now, breaking it down, we had the number of single family homes in the market that was static at 880,000 units but the number of condominium listings that actually pulled back a little to 164,000 down from 179,000 in December. Now given the very low number of listings, and we all know sales are still robust, there was just 1.9 months of supply. And that again matches the all-time low we saw in December. Now, I always find this data set particularly fascinating and another record has been broken. You see, for every sale that was agreed to in January, there were an average of 3.7 offers. And that's a massive increase from the old record of 3.5 set just the month before. But even with record low inventory, the number of sales remains remarkably impressive. Total sales of single family and multifamily units came in at an annual rate of 6.69 million in January. That's 0.6% higher than we saw in December, but it's also up by a massive 23.7% from a year ago. Now sales of single family homes were up 23% to an annual rate of 5.93 million units, and while sales of condos rose by 28.8%, to an annual rate of 760,000 units. Now, of course, some of you may be wondering, how can this be? How can sales rise when there are so few homes for sale? And that actually is a very, very reasonable question. And you see, the number of homes for sale, uh, it represents the total available at the last, or at least on the last day of the month. However, you see, sales, uh, sales can still increase because if a home is listed for sale and goes under contract in the same month, well, it's not included in the inventory numbers for that month. 
And in January, properties averaged just 21 days on the market, with 71% of them selling within the space of the month. And when we look at the details, well, pleasing to see the share of homes that sold to first-time buyers notch up a little bit, sales to investors, and these numbers, by the way, include many second home buyers, they did pull back a bit, but I'm really not concerned about that, at least not right now. And finally, again, no surprises, with many homes in the forbearance program, the share of distressed sales, just 1%. And finally, sale prices. Now, the median sale price in January was $303,900. That's up by 14.1% year over year. Now, before you get worried about the fact that it appears the prices have plateaued, it's actually not surprising. And it's mainly a function not only of seasonality, but also the limited choice of homes out there to buy. Sales of homes in the US priced below 100,000, well, they were down 28% year over year, while sales of homes priced between 500 and 750,000, they were up by 53% year over year. And not just that, sales of million dollar plus homes up by 76.7% from a year ago. Geographically, price growth was most robust in the West, where they were up by 16.1% year over year. Oh, by the way, I would add that million dollar plus sales, well, they accounted for over 11% of all sales in the Western United States. Big number. As I work through the January numbers, well, it remains very clear to me that housing is still a shining light as we move through this pandemic period. And I expect this to continue, with 2021 being another very good year for the housing market. And I still expect that we will see home sales actually rise further as a vaccine gets more broadly distributed and we reopen more of the country. So there you have it my take on the January housing related data releases. As always, if you've got any questions or comments about the numbers we've looked at today, please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Stay safe out there. And I look forward to visiting with you all again next month. Bye now.